Be, there we go. Thank you for joining us today. I wanna, I wanna just start by saying this is such an important conversation, sexuality and cancer. And um, it's not always an easy conversation, but again, an important one. I also just want to set the tone by clarifying at the beginning that this program is an inclusive one. For those who are partnered, for those who are not, no matter how one identifies, sexuality is an important topic for all. Before we begin, I want to introduce myself and share a few housekeeping details. My name is Melissa Rosa, and I will be your moderator today. I'm the Director of Training and Education at Charcheret. I want to thank our sponsors for today's webinar. These sponsors enable us to continue, continue offering meaningful programs to you. Maze, Sexual and Reproductive Health, and Merck. And I want to thank our program partners for today, Living Beyond Breast Cancer and Nibra Plastic Surgery, for collaborating with us to enhance support to all those impacted by breast or ovarian cancer. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Sharsheret's website along with a transcript for you to use as an ongoing resource. I want to assure you that participants' faces and names will not be on the recording. And if you would like, you also have the option to be anonymous during today's live webinar. You can turn off your camera and even change the name in your Zoom box. There are instructions on how to do that in the chat box now, if you'd like to. I do want to say we received so, so many important questions through registration. And I am sure questions will arise during today's presentation. So please use the chat box and we will address your questions during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. If you'd like your question to be anonymous, you can send it to Sharsheret directly in the chat box. As a reminder, Sharsheret has been providing telehealth services to the breast and ovarian cancer communities for 20 years because cancer is so much more than simply a physical experience. Sharsheret understands that treatment and survivorship are different for everyone. That's why our Thriving Again Survivorship Kit which is available to you at any, any part of your cancer experience is customizable based on each person's distinct needs and interests. Today's webinar speaker, who you see on the screen with me now, Dr. Batsheva Marcus, and today's webinar sponsor, Mays Reproductive and Sexual Health, have partnered with Sharsheret, not only on the webinar, but also to update one of the add-ons you can select to personalize your survivorship kit about sexual health, intimacy and relationships. We are so proud of this new piece and hope you find it helpful. You can order your free survivorship kit through our website at the link that's being put in the chat now. But if you've already received a survivorship kit and would like to request the newly updated sexual health resources, no problem. Please email my colleague, Amy Sachs, and her email is about to go into the chat box. If you're interested in finding out more about Charcheret's free confidential and personalized services, please email us or visit our website at charcheret.org. As we move into the webinar itself, I want to remind you that Charcheret is a national non-for-profit cancer support and education organization and does not provide any medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Shar Sherritt today and our speaker today is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for a specific medical condition. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat a health problem, but always seek the advice of your physician or qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have. We are so fortunate to have our speaker with us today, Dr. Batsheva Marcus is a certified sex therapist and the clinical director of Mays Reproductive and Sexual Health, the largest independent sexual health center in the country. And she literally wrote the book about today's topic. She's the author of Sex Points, Reclaim Your Sex Life with the Revolutionary Point System. 
And later on in today's program, we'll actually give you the chance to win a copy of that book. Dr. Marcus earned her PhD in human sexuality and a master's in public health at the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. She holds a master's degree in social work from Columbia University and a master's degree in Jewish studies from the Jewish Theological Seminary. She has lectured internationally on women's issues, gives frequent grand, grand rounds to medical health providers, and has been a guest on numerous radio and television shows, including CNBC, CBS News, Huffington Post Live, and most recently, NPR's All Things Considered. Dr. Marcus, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. You are muted. <laughs> All right, there there we go. Go. I said thank you so much for having me. You should feel totally free to call me Batsheva. Okay. I, I'm getting little notices in my, um, my uh, internet's a tad unstable, so hopefully this won't be a problem. We're just going to go for it. We're going to keep our fingers crossed. Listen, can we begin by acknowledging that this can be a difficult conversation? There's a real stigma surrounding this topic. There can be embarrassment for some, even shame, and it's complicated, right? There's physical issues, there are emotional concerns. So perhaps the best way to deal with this is simply to jump in and start a conversation with some questions. How's that? I think that's perfect. And, and I want anybody, listen, everybody listening to understand that this is such a tough conversation for everybody. So it's not just for cancer survivors or people with cancer. Like sex is just hard for us to talk about, Melissa. It just is hard. And, you know, I always hope that we'll move into a world where it's easier, but let's try to make it easier. That's right. Absolutely. So at the most basic level, does a diagnosis of cancer mean the end to your sex life? And if not, why does it feel that way so, uh, so often? That is like, that is the quintessential question. And no, the answer a hundred percent, a thousand percent. And I, I sort of, I'm starting to tear up as I say this, which usually I cry later and you know what I'm talking, but not this early, but I just want everybody listening to hear me say this. A diagnosis of cancer does not mean the end of your sex life. It will mean some challenges. It will mean some challenges. But so many things that happened in our lives also present us with challenges. And in almost every case, challenges are, you can overcome challenges. That's, that's why they're challenges. They're not, end, they're not the ends. They're not the end. So I think sometimes people lose sight, um, especially people who are struggling with cancer or have, you know, trauma from having had cancer because they feel like it's, it's sort of the death knell to their sex life. And I want you to hear now from me that that is just not the case, that, that so many people struggle in so many ways with their sex life. You know, people who end up in, you know, with other physical ailments, people just as we age, things change. And that the more you can recognize that your sex life in every situation is gonna hit road bumps. And cancer is a road bump. It's a big road bump. I'm not making light of the fact that, but it is a road bump and there is always ways around those road bumps. And um, we'll talk about, and some of those road bumps are actually physiological, like they're medical and they need to be addressed. And some of those road bumps are psychological and are about our feelings about ourselves and how it affects impacts on our relationship. But I do feel like if you start with the assumption that it's nothing's gonna help, it, it makes you feel very unempowered. And that is not a useful way to head into your sex life. So what I would say is say to yourself this, maybe my sex life is not working for me now. And that is honestly true about so many people who don't have cancer also, right? Like I have an entire practice that's just full of people who are coming in constantly saying, you know, I have no desire for sex. I have trouble having, getting aroused. My orgasms aren't what they used to be. Um, I have pain with sex. Oh my God, I have pain with sex. All of those people, they have it also. So the fact that you are struggling with either cancer or the treatments from cancer that have created some of these problems makes these problems sort of highlighted for you, but they are not insolvable. And that's the most important thing for you to know and remember. That's a very hopeful way to start this conversation. Thank you for setting that tone. So what are some of the most common concerns that cancer patients might face and how might we approach some of these concerns? 
Okay, so that's a huge question, Melissa. So why don't I break it down a little bit and then you can decide where you want to go with it. How's that? Okay. okay well, where okay. the people listening want to vote in. We could just do a little, <laughs> like a little vote. Okay. So pain is a big one because people who have vaginas, pain, but it's pain with intercourse. And I want to, I could talk, oh my God, I could talk for an hour and a half about how distorted our view of sex is when it's so intercourse based. When we talk about intercourse being penis and vagina, sex does not have to be penis and vagina. There's a million other ways to have sex with your mouth, with your hands, with your toys, with feathers, with your breasts, with your, you know, with your ass. There's a million other ways to have sex that do not involve a penis and a vagina, but for many, many people, especially heterosexual people, that has been sort of the basis of their sex life. And so the vagina in particular is extremely hormonally mediated and is gonna be the first thing to feel it when your hormones are off. And, and truth is perimenopausal, I menopausal women who don't have cancer have very, very similar issues as women who have been diagnosed with cancer or have been treated for cancer and therefore their vaginas are just in a different place, but it can be treated. And I am happy to talk about how to get your vagina back on track because for a lot of people, that's really an important and central part of their sex life. So that's issue one. Issue two is because of all those hormonal shifts that are happening, people's desire drops, right? Their desire to have sex drops and their arousal, their ability to get turned on drops. And arousal and desire are separate things. And we can talk about how they're a little bit different. They play off each other all the time, but they are different. But that could be because of dramatic hormonal shifts also. Again, I will say to you, perimenopausal women and menopausal women very often come in with the same complaints. I'm just not interested in sex anymore or my body doesn't respond. I'm not getting wet. I'm not getting turned on. I can't, I can't get that laundry list out of my head. I still keep thinking about making the kids peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, even though I want to be thinking about the hot person in my bed, right? So there's those pieces of it. Um, and then sometimes orgasm, sometimes our orgasms can be affected both by the hormonal issues as well. Now I'm going to layer on top of that, and again, these are not unique to cancer patients, but they're important, which is our sense of ourselves has changed, right? Our, our, um, our comfort level with our bodies. Some, some of us have had surgeries on our bodies and we just, we don't necessarily feel as attractive or as sexual beings as we used to do once upon a time. Our relationships shift also because, you know, some of us go from being these like very competent, capable people, and we're still competent, capable people, but we need help in ways we may not have needed help at other times in our life. So all of those things are playing into your sex life. And um, again, I want to say to you, these things play into a lot of people's sex lives, not just cancer patients and cancer survivors, but they can be extremely sort of overwhelming when they sort of hit you all at one time. And, and more than that, I feel like it's hard to have a roadmap to how to get yourselves out of this. Like you feel like you're mired in this, you know, you know, this, this plate of spaghetti is the way I often talk to my patients. Like they come in and they dump this whole plate of spaghetti, their sex life isn't working. And my work with them is to pull out the strands and figure out, okay, what's actually not working and where, where, where can we get you help? So that seems a little bit to me like a chicken and the egg, all right? So you have you have the physical things, whether it's a change in hormones or 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 a surgical change, you have the emotional things, whether you're overwhelmed by cancer or you don't you're, you're not comfortable with it, your own body. And so those lead possibly to a, a diminished um, diminished desire and arousal and some physical pain. Which comes first when addressing it to get a sex life back on track? So I have to say my, I have a, I think they work together. Okay. I think that we don't, we have created a false dichotomy in our society between the brain and the body. We just have, like they work, the, the, the study that I love to quote because it always sort of opens people's eyes is a study that came out, I don't know, a few years ago, the New York Times did it on men and testosterone. So these were men who stayed home with their children, who chose to stay home with their children and their testosterone levels dropped. Okay, think about that, right? Their behavior affected their hormone levels. So we don't, we, we get sometimes that our hormones affect our behavior level. I can't, I can't have the number of women who come in and say like, I'm just not very interested in sex anymore. I'm actually uninterested in sex. 
and it's hormonal. And they're like, but it can't be hormonal because it's the way I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, what do you think makes you think about it? Right. Like, so, um, so, you know, the, 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 the analogy I often like to use, and this also sort of gets people to understand kind of where this interplay is, is if you see two 17 year olds at, you know, waiting in line or on the bus, let's say you see two 17 year olds on the bus together. This is kind of pre COVID, but anyway, and they're climbing all over each other, right? They can't keep their hands off each other. If you're watching these and you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, do you start thinking to yourself, Melissa, they must have had a truly meaningful conversation? No, that's not what you think, right? Or he must have done the dishes or he must have brought flowers. You think their hormones are raging, right? Like that. And legitimately, that's what you think. And yet, when it comes to people who've been through cancer treatment or let's say perimenopausal women, somehow we're, we're uncomfortable saying, oh, maybe the hormones are the problem. So I think they, they work together. And I think that what I often will say to, to patients is, let's start working on the things that you feel comfortable working with. And if you kind of get stuck, so let's say we decide to try to work on your fantasy life, because I, I think that's a, good, that's a good thing to talk about. Because that's very practical, it's easy, not so easy maybe, but we'll talk about it. But if you get stuck, I would say to you, yeah, take, let's take a look at your hormones, right? So, so when you look at desire, when your problems with desire and arousal, I would say, you know, my bias a little bit is towards the physiological, towards the medical, only because I feel like as a society, we have put so much emphasis on the psychological and the relationship, right? So, you know, if a person comes in and says, my sex drive is, you know, plummeting, they're so quick to say it must be my relationship. And I'm like, well, but you've been in the same relationship for 40 years. I get you're a little bored, but you were bored 20 years ago too. And um, and it's a pretty good relationship as you're describing it to me. There's nothing terrible happening in the relationship. Nothing dramatic has changed, but your yet your level for, of desire for sex has, seems to have gone down. And so let's not go through a rabbit hole of two years of counseling before we figure out whether or not there is something physiological going on because sometimes the lack of sex creates the problems in the relationship or the two years of digging at the relationship to figure out what it, it what the hell is the matter creates the problem in the relationship so um so i think melissa what's really really important for people to realize is that there's a complicated interplay and i think most people are extremely smart about figuring out we tend to like go towards the psychological just because that's what we've been told and that's what you know our gut reaction is oh it must be the relationship it must be but i'm going to tell you if you're working on that you shouldn't have to work so hard you shouldn't have to work you should be able to work a little bit and have results and if you're not then i say let's look at the physiological let's look at the medical the exception to what I'm saying is really any pain, okay? That is not psychological. I mean, I've, if I have to like stand on my head and say it 53,000 times, you know, if the doctor says to you, I don't see anything, therefore it must be in your head, I'll tell you what you should do. You should leave and you should find yourself a new doctor because just because they don't see anything does not mean that the pain is psychological. And so, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been quoted often as saying, and it's hundred percent true that when somebody says to me, I've been seeing a therapist for six months for my pain. And my therapist says, your vagina is trying to tell you that you're not ready to have intercourse. I'll be like, Nope, your vagina is telling you that you need to find a new therapist. So <laughs> go out and find a new therapist. So, so pain is the one exception where in 99.9% .9 of the times, it really is medical. That doesn't mean that there aren't psychological implications that have to be addressed, but it really is medical. And I think I just gave you an extraordinarily long answer to a very short question. So I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It led to lots of other questions in my mind. So can you just elaborate with regard to cancer specifically or cancer and, and the cancer treatments. What are some of the causes of the pain and what can be done about it without undermining the treatment? So the, the biggest, the biggest, biggest, biggest factor here is that in many cancer treatments, they're trying to get rid of your estrogen. Like I, that's like easiest way. They, they're trying to like eliminate estrogen in your body. Your body needs a certain level of estrogen to function the way you're used to it functioning. And if not, you've got to find a figure out ways to manage without it. We'll talk about those. Your vagina in particular, if you have a vagina, your vagina in particular is incredibly hormonally mediated. It means it's the first one to first part of your body to feel it when that, that, that estrogen, you know, dries up. So that is the most, most common thing. The other thing that the hormonal changes do is it could kill your ability to 
the other three, the other the triad, arousal, orgasm, and, and desire, right? It, it makes it harder for you to get to want to have sex. It gets harder for you to get turned on when you have sex, and it makes it harder to have an orgasm. However, the good news is those three are a little more intrinsically linked to testosterone than they are to estrogen. So let's go back to the vagina for those of you with a vagina. So the, let's go back to the vagina. You, first of all, more and more physicians are getting comfortable with use of local estrogen in your vagina. Now, for people who don't understand the difference, and I, I outline this all, uh, quite clearly in my book because I feel like this is so, this gets so confused, systemic versus local estrogen. There's estrogen that's meant only to stay in your vagina and vulva area, clitoris, vulva, vagina, that whole area. Then there's estrogen that's meant to systemically um, circulate throughout your body. Most, most cancer treatments wants to get rid of the circulating estrogen, right? That's most cancer treatments. Some of them really want to get rid of local as well. And this is really where you have to talk to your doctor. But what we have discovered at our center is that more and more um, oncologists are comfortable using local estrogen, using local estrogen, especially because more and more um, local estrogens are coming in in smaller dosages. So uh, there's a product called Invexi. I don't know if people are familiar with Invexi. I get no money from, I want to know I'm getting no money from any product. So I just want to be really clear about that. Invexi is now coming in at a 0.4, which is about half or a third of sort of the classic um, estrogen products that you would normally insert into your vagina, um, like estrace and whatever. And so doctors are much more comfortable with that. However, if for whatever reason, either you or your doctor are totally freaked out about the idea of using estrogen locally, there are really good alternatives to make your vagina feel better. So one of them is hyaluronic acid, which you may be familiar with. Again, I, I do outline all this stuff in, in my book because I feel like I'm going through a lot of stuff very quickly. Or even I think our website, the Maze Women's website may have it. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. Um, but there are a number of over-the-counter products. So the worst thing to do is to think that by adding lubricant, you're going to solve your problem. I just need to say that. Like, that's where everybody jumps to. Oh, my vagina is dry and, you know, etheramic. It's like, it's like, what happens is if you look at your vagina, it gets very thin and like tissue papery. So lubricant is not going to do anything. I mean, it's going to help a little because it's going to put something wet in your vagina for a few minutes, but it's not going to help that tissue in any way get better. That's the problem. It's not going to make it plumper. Okay. So, um, so um, either a hyaluronic acid works quite well, and there's a product called Reverie out there, which is really good. And there, you, th those you can buy, you can buy them over the counter, not super inexpensive, but, but very effective. And it's the same hyaluronic acid you use on your face. It's great. Hyaluronic acid is amazing. Anyway, so, but it's for specifically meant for vagina. And then there's a laser called the Mona Lisa. Um, and the Femlift, Femilift, I think is the other one called, we have the Mona Lisa, we don't have the Femilift, but I think they're pretty much the same. Um, and they do, it's fascinating. They basically go in, they don't hurt. I want to just say they don't hurt. They sometimes are irritated the day after and everybody's like, oh my God, a laser in my vagina. Like it really doesn't hurt. Um, it um, basically, it goes in and it, it sort of attacks or destroys, I know it sounds terrible, the mucosa or the skin on the inside of the vagina. And it says to it, you need to repair, you need to repair. And so the vagina creates new mucosa. So um, it's pretty cool. It's two or three treatments. Um, it is, of course, not covered by insurance, but we can have a whole conversation about women's health and insurance coverage. But um, it is a fabulous, fabulous alternative for women who don't want to use um, local estrogen. So that is... Um, that is my speech about, you know, products that you might want to consider for your vagina. And I would say to you, if your vagina is a mess, you might just, even though you can have great sex without using your vagina, for most women, it just feels yicky to not have a, you know, to have a vagina that doesn't feel good. And, um, and I am, there's another thing people might want to consider, which is um, moisturizers, vaginal moisturizers, which is different than lubricant. Lubricant goes, am I talking too quickly, Melissa? No, you're good. There's a okay. lot of information to cover. <laughs> Um, I have a tendency when I get excited to talk really, really, really fast. So that's one of the reasons we record it. So people can go back and use the recording as a resource. In half speed. You can listen to me in half speed. It's great. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, so what I was, uh, what was I going to say? I was talking, vaginal moisturizer. Uh, right. So the moisturizer is not going to fix the mucosa in your vagina, 
but it may make you feel wetter. And for some women, that's actually quite helpful. It just makes them, you can use moisturizer every single day. It won't do anything bad. It just makes you feel just moister in the area, in the vagina. And what's kind of cool I've discovered is it's a little, what I would call reverse Pavlovian response, which is that, you know how when you get turned on, you get wet. So sometimes when you're feeling wet, you're like, oh, I could get turned on. And it's, it, it works quite well for you. Over the counter, easy, easy to handle. So that's the, that's talking about the vagina and the pain with the vagina. When we're getting into arousal orgasm and, um, you know, and arousal orgasm and desire, that is where testosterone can be super duper helpful for women. And more, again, more and more, um, more and more physicians are fine. And once upon a time, like 15 years ago, when we started this, you know, I would say medical people, you know, medical professionals were nervous about testosterone because they thought it might convert into estrogen. We see very, very nominal conversion into estrogen and we keep a good eye on bloods, um, but it has a, can have a dramatic impact on all of those, on all of those, what I call quadrants. Cause I have broken in my book, I have qu four quadrants, like pain, arousal, orgasm, desire. So on those three quadrants, those, it can be super duper helpful testosterone. I would just hazard anybody watching and talking, thinking about it, that you go to somebody who actually really knows what they're doing, keeps an eye on your blood levels. Um, there are other products and it's, it's a, it's a long-term project. It's like a six to eight month project to see if it works, but it works quite well. You know, you can use it as a cream. There's a pellet that can be inserted. Like testosterone is, I am a huge testosterone fan. I feel like women, people, we think of testosterone as a male hormone and, but women have it and need it. So, um, and that's another one, by the way, which is not unique to you guys, cancer people, like as women get older, their testosterone drops. You just, catapulted into that, unfortunately. So um, more and more, and there's actually really good data now in terms of um, breast, um, uh, sorry, not breast, um, cancer risks with testosterone. And if Melissa, if you ask me after this is over, I'm happy to give you a meta-analysis that was done a number of years ago on, on that, because I think it's really interesting. So um, now also there's a few other products that have recently gotten FDA approval for women's desire, one is called Addy, one, um, and one is called by Lisi. Um, they're, you know, I feel like they're good. They're not as effective, but there's something to think about. Again, I talk about all this in my book, and you know, you could do a little research on your own if you're interested in that, or any sexual health medicine doctor will be able to help you with that. So a question came in. In addition to these over-the-counter things, some of the procedures like Mona Lisa. Are there other things and, me and medicines that can be prescribed? Are there other things like maybe pelvic floor exercises? Does that impact at all? When you're talking about pain, vaginal pain with intercourse, it does. That's a really, whoever asked that, you're very smart. So it's, the, but it's the secondary issue. So what's being caused by the cancer treatment is generally this sucking out of all your estrogen. I mean, that's often the case. And so, but what happens is as soon as the muscle either because we're not sure why this happens, but either because it starts to be a little painful and so people clench their muscles or just because the estrogen was keeping the muscles and the skin, everything kind of lubricated and now it isn't, things are tightening up. What happens is the, the muscles tighten up and that can cause a different kind of pain. It's a, it's a pain that's called sort of in the vernacular vaginismus um, right, which vaginismus is like exactly that, the tightening up of the muscles that you can't, nothing can get in there, um, or you could get something in, but it just hurts when you put it in there. Um, pelvic floor physical therapy can help with that. So pelvic floor, I love pelvic floor physical therapists. I think they're angels, many of them. I will say to you, if you think that's what's happened to you and you don't want to get started with pelvic floor physical therapy, which can be very extended, um, you could just buy dilators. There are these things called vaginal dilators. They're easily purchased, you know, on the internet. Um, they come in different sizes and you can just insert them. You know, some vaginismus patients, you know, young women who've never had intercourse are petrified and that's, so they have a hard time using those dilators. But for most of the women who are um, watching here, people with vaginas who are watching here, um, you're not scared. You're not a scare other than you know it's going to hurt legitimately. So, you know, using a good moisturizer and lubricant and using those dilators can be unbelievably helpful. And those dilators are often used by physicians when they've done treatments that actually have resulted in the narrowing of the vaginal canal. And so they want to kind of restretch it. And all that does is 
help you restretch. Because the just for people to understand, your vagina is not a tube. Like it's not a hole that's there, right? It's a potential space. It's muscles that go in and go out. It's so you have to teach the muscles not to clamp down. It's just like if you were learning to do a split and you wouldn't like push the person down into a split like immediately. That sounds horrible, right? So slowly but surely you want to be able to use those muscles. Space is a good way to think about it. I saw a question come in. One of the things you talked about in the this last answer was vaginal moisturizers, and a couple of people were asking for product recommendations. I, I so those are all over the counter, and so I can't tell you. I mean, I feel like I would look for reviews. To be uh, to be honest with you, this with lubricants and vaginal moisturizers, lubricants I can probably tell you liquid silk or liquid seem to be super. People like it, and coconut oil. Coconut oil is awesome. Can I just say coconut oil? I was just talking to one of my therapists, and she's like. Like, I was just talking to a patient. We use coconut oil for everything. My face, my vagina, everything. Anyway, so um, so coconut oil is great. But the thing is about both lubricants and vaginal moisturizers is it's very personal. It's a little bit like your shampoo. You know, you want to get into an argument with a woman about, like, uh, my shampoo is better than your shampoo, right? Like, everybody's different. So, I yeah. Okay, that's, that's good to keep in mind. So, I'm sort of now flip-flopping between questions we got at registration and some of the like more global questions. But one thing that um, strikes me as part of some of the questions we got that might be appropriate now is, is there ever a point of no return? If somebody's been through treatment, they've stopped having intercourse, penetra penetrative intercourse, um, because it was painful, there's little desire, like after a certain number of years, is it too late? <laughs> no, no, that's good. It's never too late. Now I said to you, I always tear up at different points. Like now I'm like, it is never too late. It may take more work. It may take more work and more concerted effort. And, and I think what you need to understand is that our brains are very plastic, right? Neuro, neuroplasticity is something we're starting to understand. And when you shut down a part of your brain, if you shut down all the circuits that were involved in, you know, pleasure, a certain kind of pleasure, it is hard work to turn those circuits back on again. I'm not going to pretend it's not, but it 100% can be done, Melissa. And I, whoever wrote that question, I want you to know I'm with you. It is doable. It is totally 100% doable. You have to figure out your entry point. And so if you are, that's what I said, for a lot of people, the entry point is their vagina. They just want their vagina to feel better and stop hurting. And so for a lot of people, that's kind of easier and concrete way to go in. For other people, and I, so I'm going to jump back to fantasy right now, because I feel like that's the, probably the quintessential place where so many of us shut down a part of our brain. And I think we all do it. And the more sex is a struggle, or the more that we have other crises happening in our life, the less we go to that part of the brain. And yet, and yet we know that, that those parts of the brain can come alive again. Like if you're good at languages and you just do not use any foreign languages for a bunch of years, we know what happens in the circuitry of your brain. It shuts down, the, it just stops. Those, those neurotransmitters are like, oh, we're on vacation. Like I'm not gonna, your brain is not gonna waste effort on sections of the brain that it's not using. And so the neurotransmitters stop blinking, the, you know, basically there's less synapses going off. Like there's just no activity in that part of the brain. And so that means that you have to do the work to get that part of the brain functioning again. But once you start learning languages again, it's really hard work in the beginning to get that French up and running, but then the German becomes easier and the Italian gets even easier, right? So what I would say is I will often say to women, connecting with your fantasy life is really a good entryway and a way to start because so often people say, well, fantasies, those should happen naturally, right? Like I should, well, a fantasy is something that happens naturally and I'm gonna be like, yeah, it happens naturally for those 17-year-olds we were just talking about on the bus. They have lots of lots of spontaneous fantasies. Not so much for many of us, and certainly not people who've been through the trauma of, of um, a really difficult illness and or just life, you know, busy, crazy lives where other things take priority. So I will highly recommend that people start working, working on their fantasy life, even if that sounds insane. And that may be by watching some erotica, reading. I feel like women connect to written erotica much more than they do to other forms of, I mean, I don't, I could say I think that, but that data shows it front, left, and center. Like women do not go so much to porn or classic porn sites, but literotica, which is a written erotic site, has 
billions of women on it for long periods of time. Um, there's now audio erotica. There's a, um, a white website called Dipsy, uh, sort of an app called Dipsy, which has actors reading erotic stories. Um, and it feels really uncomfortable when you start kind of digging into this. You want to get it into your brain. You want to eventually be able to just create things in your brain. But in the beginning, you may have to use external forces to do that. And if you start finding that it's really hard to do that, that's where I say, like, look at the testosterone. Because the testosterone is going to help that part of your brain come alive, basically, is what's going on. So, um, you know, so never, I would say, never give up. I mean, never, ever give up with the caveat that if you don't care, like I often people say, no, why should I care? And I'm like, you don't have to care. If you do, if you honestly do not care about having a sex life, then that's fine. Like you're not going to die from not having a sex life, right? By yourself, even by, by having sex by yourself. But I'm talking about single people here as well. Like sex for one is a fabulous way to have sex, frankly, a lot less pressure. You always know when you're in the mood, you're the best, best possible partner you could have. Um, so, you know, if you're, you know, I would say if you're not partnered, and you sort of feel like, well, is it worth the effort? Then I would say you have to make that decision. But my experience is that people feel more alive and more whole and more, more who they are and happy when they're connected to their sexual self. Um, so, um, and I have to assume that anybody who came onto this webinar is sort of feeling like that's something that they want in their life. And we know that sex, when you're partnered, sex is important. It's just like an important part of your life. And, and, um, you know, I, I will have women, I, you know, women will often say, they'll even use this, almost the same language to me, which is always amusing. And they'll say something like, if I come home and my partner and I, you know, I see my partner's socks on the floor and we haven't had sex in a long time, I will scoop them up and I want to stuff them down his or her mouth. Like, you know, I just, I'm so angry. But if I come in and we've been having great sex, I sort of laugh and I pick them up and I dump them in the hamper. So I feel like what happens Sex is so important in relationships because it changes the tenor of the relationship. And that's with ourselves as well. So um, I'm your biggest cheerleader. I believe everybody. I don't think anybody's too far gone. I do not believe, you know, I've worked with women who are 72, who had their first orgasm. Like, I just, I do not believe you are too far gone. Okay, that is another piece of encouraging information. Um, so... Can we just talk for a second about, um, and something you just touched on, about how relationships are impacted when, when there is no physical sex. And, and that's not, I'm not even talking about like different, different drives and one partner wants it and the other partner is uncomfortable doing it. I'm just talking about when there's there's little physical sex in a relationship, how does that impact the relationship? So the data suggests that relationships are better when there's a sexual component. And that is not to say, and I don't want anybody to get off here and saying, Bacheva said it's impossible to have a good relationship without sex of any sort. I'm not saying that's true. And there are, I have seen couples where that's the case, but for the most part, sex can work as the glue in a really important way in a relationship. And one of the things that I think I watch happen when there's illness is that um, sex gets put on the back burner and then nobody's quite sure how to pull it back to a front burner. And that's where like, how do you make a habit? And the partners of the people who are ill feel guilty for wanting to have sex, right? They feel like somehow it's not okay for them to want to have sex. And for sometimes, especially if we're talking about, let's say a woman who's, um, who's, who's faced cancer and then she's married to a man, for many men, they feel like they've lost two things. They've lost the sex and they've lost the physical contact because the woman will say, well, every time I try to just kiss him or hug him, he understands that as my wanting to be willing to have sex and I'm really not up for that yet. And so often partners of the people who are facing illness will be feeling like a double loss as will the person who's facing the illness themselves who feel like they don't have the physical, they're not getting the physical comfort they want because it's too like, it's too treacherous waters because they're afraid that, you know, they'll have to deal with the sex. And I feel like the best way to handle that is to talk about it. Like, I feel like that feels to me like the kind of thing that a conversation needs to be had. Like, 
what can we do in the meantime? Like, what are you up to doing in the meantime? What are you willing to do in the meantime? What would you like to do in the meantime? What would be meaningful to you in the meantime? And that conversation should be had kind of regularly because that will shift. I really think, Melissa, like, it's not like it's from today to tomorrow, the same thing. And, but I will say there's a, a wonderful movie, which I'd, I'd highly recommend people watch called um, Hope Springs, Hope Springs. Okay, not to be mixed up with Hope Floats. Hope Springs with Tommy Lee Jones and um, 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 uh, what's her name? Oh my God, Miranda P. Priestley. Um, um, you know how I mean. Oh, um... Meryl Streep. And Meryl Streep and Tom, I mean, how could you go wrong with Tommy Lee Jones? But it's about a couple who hasn't had sex in a very long time and they've sleep in separate bedrooms. And the woman just feels like she's feeling so lonely, she, she can't handle it anymore. And so it's a little Hollywood, I'll give you that. But what I love about that movie was it showed the tenor of the relationship, the playfulness, the way the shift of the relationship when you put the sex back in. You know, Melissa, I'll always say to people, I'm not in this field because I'm so fascinated by putting body part A into body part B, what's, what's meaningful to me is what shifts in a relationship when the set, when you put sexuality back in. And that's, I said, it's about yourself as well. Like there's something, there's something elemental and real about sex and our sexual selves. And when we're, when we're sort of not in conversation, not able to be there with our sexual self, it just changes things. And that's true about our partners as well. I just took a look at the clock and so I could keep talking, uh, you know, like this forever, but there were some, some, um, some participant questions that I think are really important to get to. Please, if you're on this webinar and you've, you've asked a question, listen for the themes and ideas because many of the questions were very similar and focused around a few things. First, before I go into that, I saw somebody posted in the chat box about, um, about um, vibrators and and um, the the dilators, the dilators. Wh who would you talk to about that? Would it be your OBGYN, your oncologist, a sex therapist? So the dilators, you can definitely talk to your oncologist. And I just saw a note, please speak slower. I'm trying. Okay, so um, the dilators, you can definitely speak to your oncologist about. Um, maybe your OBGYN, the vibrators, don't bother. They're not going to have a good conversation with you, but I will give you, I have a free three-part course on introduction to vibrators on May's Women's Sexual Health. If you go to May's Women's Sexual Health and you look up orgasm or it's somewhere around there, you'll float it around, just look vibrators. I did a three-part video series specifically as an introduction to sort of demystify the whole thing for people. So um, I'm having the book too, but that is more fun. Yeah. I think the course is more fun. Okay. So let's get to some some callers questions. So um, a lot focused on reclaiming sexuality and self-esteem and the interplay between self-esteem and sexuality, especially as you you alluded to earlier, many of our bodies are covered in scars or we're missing parts, particularly parts that were integral to our sex lives prior to a diagnosis. So how, how do we start to reclaim our sexuality uh, personally? And then if we're a partner, you know, to bring it to, our, um, to the partners. And is there a way to start slowly and not just jump right back in? So I feel, I'm very practical. And I feel like the most effective way that I have seen working for my patients is self-talking. Is, is, is sort of a combination of um, finding sort of what I'll call hacks and self-talking. So that may mean finding some really pretty lingerie or, you know, a nightgown that you just think is really fun that covers, covers you up to start with. You may not be totally willing to be 100% naked with your partner again until you get more comfortable with yourself. And I feel like talking to yourself in the mirror, it sounds so hokey, but I feel like it is so empowering. You know, get naked from the mirror or or just or uncover one part of your body. Let's say it's your breasts and see, say to yourself, my breasts, my skin is so beautifully white. Do you know what I mean? Like my smile is amazing. And um, and I and I'm beautiful. And I just get you have to realize to a certain degree that our bodies, they're they're so bizarre regular bodies it just it's just that we're used to them right like if you if a martian landed here they, they wouldn't see a difference between a body that had surgery or a body that didn't have surgery right like i think 
they'd see a difference, but they wouldn't necessarily intuitively think was one more beautiful than the other, right? This has to do with our societal norms, which are so deep. I, I really don't want to minimize them at all. But I do think that exposure, talking to yourself, um, and, and, and finding things that things to wear that makes you feel beautiful are really incredibly helpful. And let's go back to the talking to your partner piece, because I think in a lot of cases, your partner, you need to listen to them. I, I cannot tell you how often I'm in the room where the partner says, but I think she's beautiful and she feels so broken. And I, and I, I, you know, you're, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to minimize, I think it's really important to have a therapist here to work through some of these issues, but if you can allow your partner to like listen to your partner and hear what she or he has to say, it can be very healing. That was great. Um, a couple people asked, how do I find a doctor or a therapist who specializes in this? Obviously now they're aware of you, but people are across the country on this webinar. Is there a website that lists them or something like that? So there's the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, which lists therapists and physicians that deal specifically with sexual health. And they should all be able to deal with um, you know, post-cancer post -cancer issues as they deal with many other things. Um, you know, I would be wary, I will say this, when you look on like psychology today to find a sex therapist, I'd be wary about um, anybody who has a lot of specialties, right? If you're a sex, if you're a couple, if you do a sex therapy and you do one or two other things like couples therapy and sex therapy, but if you do sex therapy and EMDR and eating disorders and, you know, child psychology, I'd be wary of that. Um, there's another organization called ASECT, American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, and they also have a listing of sex therapists who should be able, you can look through and you can, and I would say, be brutal. You know, I'll often say to people, when you're looking for a therapist, make three appointments, make three first appointments. It sounds like a waste of time and money, but at the end of those three appointments, you will say, oh my God, I really connected with this person. I feel good about this person, as opposed to well, maybe it seemed like it was okay. And so invest in yourself because you're going to end up seeing this other person 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. It's worth the up, upfront investment. Thank you. And by the way, somebody asked to replete the information. It was just put, it, the name of the organization was just put in to the chat box. Um, okay. So that was the ISS, that's ISWISH. That's the doctor. And then there's ASECT, American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors and Therapists, separate organization. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, a couple of very specific things that we didn't get to. Somebody asked about recurrent UTIs since, since treatment every time she has intercourse. Is there something that can be done preventatively as opposed to treating it after? Well, sometimes it's because the vagina itself is just so dry and, and irritated. And so it, it ends up, things end up moving into the urethra that shouldn't move into the urethra. So sometimes just like the Mona Lisa could possibly be extremely helpful here. Other than that, what they do is they give you antibiotics preventatively. So, and probiotics, big thing, probiotics guys, start paying attention to there's probiotics that are put out specifically for your vagina. The same company that makes the reverie that I talked about makes a probiotic for the vagina. That would probably be very useful as well. Thank you. Somebody just put in the chat box now, is it, is it okay to have sex during treatment chemotherapy? I don't know the answer. I'm assuming it is, but that you have to talk to your oncologist about. I, I, I don't see why it would not be okay, but definitely talk to your oncologist. But go you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, somebody asked again about Mona Lisa. So in one sentence, can you just explain what it is one more time? It's a laser that is used. It's a probe that gets put into your vagina. It's about a 15 minute procedure and it doesn't hurt, but it basically uses these beams um, to destroy essentially the vaginal mucosa so that it rebuilds. It, it tells it to rebuild a new set of vaginal mucosa. So you use it, you, it's like two or three treatments, and then you usually need some kind of booster every year, the year and a half, two years, depending on your vagina. Perfect. Somebody else asked about um, the particular challenges for people who are living with, uh, with metastatic cancer. <sighs> so, Treatment may not end, you know, things like that. So... 
I think that I honestly think the challenges are probably not that different, just just more. There's just more of them. Do you know what I mean like, and it's scarier. And um, that is the situation where I'm sure people in this situation have told you or whoever's asking this question that I really do feel like therapy, sort of figuring out what your priorities are. Like, what do you want? Like, I feel to me like, right, you need to figure out like, what do you have bandwidth for and what do you want? And what will your doctors allow you to use? Because you may say, I don't want to deal with intercourse right now, but that, and that's fine. I just, I don't know that the challenges are fundamentally different other than they just feel to me like they're just stacked on top of each other. Melissa, you could help me if I'm wrong, because that does is sort of where it feels like to me. Obviously everybody's different, but that seems like a, a good assessment. We have time for two more questions. So, um, Somebody asked about using um, post-treatment, post-active treatment, a libido question. Wants to know if other things ha have it, or they've tried um, antidepressants like Wellbutrin and things like that. They've tried switching aromatase inhibitors, acupuncture, taking a vacation from the aromatase inhibitors. Is there anything new besides that approach? You mentioned testosterone is a potential option. Anything else? Yeah. So there's a product out there called Addy. First of all, Wellbutrin is not going to be useful for desire, just for everybody here. And Wellbutrin is actually quite useful for arousal and orgasm. Uh -huh. um, I explained this more in my book, so, but I, I would jump into that. But I know people that just throw Wellbutrin. I love Wellbutrin. Amazing drug, but it just doesn't help for desire. Um, testosterone can be unbelievable unbelievably helpful. <clears throat> Number one, there's two, as I said, there's two drugs out there by Lisi and, um, and Addy. Both of them are approved for desire. I actually think Addy, it's a daily drug. You take, it's similar to an antidepressant, but it's specifically meant for desire. Um, and then there's by Lisi, which is used, it's an injection. It doesn't hurt. It freaks everybody out. It's an injection you use and use it right before you have sex before you have any kind of sex. Um, and um, both of those are recently approved. So my first go-to honestly would be um, testosterone. Um, and uh, there's another off, uh, off the count, over the counter one called Ristella, Ristella um, which seems to have some efficacy as well, but those are like, again, testosterone is super duper helpful. Ristella, a little helpful. Addy, a little helpful. Vilesi, a little helpful. Would all of these things also help not just with desire, but like intensity of orgasm if that's been diminished? So by Lisi, which is the shot, would affect the intensity of orgasm. Well, butrin is super duper helpful with intensity of orgasm. Testosterone is super helpful with intensity of orgasm. Um, yeah. yeah, there options. are definitely options, but they're 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 su they're much more subtle as well as testosterone which really, I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but testosterone really works. And the other ones are just more subtle. Okay. All right. Last question. It's more like I'm asking you for a parting thought. Somebody, somebody talks about how their cancer diagnosis and subsequent treatments has truly deeply impacted the way they feel about not just sex and sexuality, but gender. And I just wonder for people who are struggling to feel either feminine, if that's what they're looking for, or just to feel more like themselves again. Like what, what thoughts do you, parting thoughts do you have? Whenever you hit a severe illness, it makes you reevaluate your life. I mean, I think it, it makes you reevaluate who you are and how you move through the world. And some of that is for some people that's going to hit on the gender, on the gender quad, you know, put the part of themselves that's gender. For some people, it'll hit on the relationships. That's why relationships often, you know, for some people it hits on like the careers and what they want to do with their lives, right? What I would say to you is this, the most important thing about your sexuality is that it's unique to you and it doesn't have to belong to anybody else. It just has to be you, which is why I struggle a little when people use a lot of labels like bisexual and, you know, sapiosexual and parasexual and you know, because in the end, I'm just butcheva sexual and Melissa, you're just Melissa sexual. And that's kind of the way it should be, right? What I like and what I want to think about and how I want to move through the world is just mine and how you do you is yours. And, but I do believe all of us should be able, if possible, to connect to our sexuality. That means that we can connect to sexual pleasure, um, to orgasm, if that's what we want, um, 
to, to being able to think sexual thoughts and they don't have to fit into a box of any sort, you know? And, and so maybe a good way to look at this is that this is a time that you get to explore and be a little different and sort of reevaluate. And, and maybe that could be, maybe that could be a really lovely, maybe as you're moving around your road bumps, you'll find a new pathway that really um, brings love you to it. some special places. I, I love that. Listen, we could talk for so much longer, but we're already a few minutes beyond where I wanted to, to take a pause. Listen, the first thing, Batsheva, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I learned so much today, and I hope all of you did too. For ongoing information on the topic, we absolutely recommend that you follow Batsheva and Mays on Instagram and check out their website. Links to both are in the chat now. And, and Right before we started, Batsheva said she answers a lot of questions on Instagram. So if you have questions, that's the place to go. Once again, thank you to May's Sexual and Reproductive Health and to Merck for supporting this important program and Living Beyond Breast Cancer and NIBRA for their community partnership. There is also a uh, link to a brief evaluation survey on today's program. It's linked in the chat box right now, I see it. Anyone who completes the evaluation today will be in the running to win a copy of Dr. Marcus's book. Please remember that Charcheret is here for you, for your loved ones during this time. We provide emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs designed to help you navigate through the cancer experience. All are free, completely private, and one-on-one. -on -one. Our, our email and our telephone number will be in there. And listen, I just want to say, as I as I uh, finish up with the last couple of things, I am seeing in the chat box, thank you, thank you, amazing presentation, so helpful. So really, everybody thinks so. Okay, we'd love to stay connected with you by social media too. So take a moment to, to um, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram or Twitter, where we post um, amazing information, some creative things and information about programs that we have coming up. So speaking of programs, Monday night, this coming Monday night, we have a program called Beyond BRCA about not only BRCA genetic mutations that raise diagnostic risk for cancer, but other ones and what they mean to us individually. And in January, we're planning, um, among others, two great webinars. One is creating survivorship care plans, which could include addressing sexual health with your healthcare team. And the other one is our next uh, Charcheret in the Kitchen, on cancer nutrition. From all of us at Charcheret, thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Bajeva. Thank you.